I want to begin as well with thanks to the organizers, to Dr. Jörg Müller, who organized all of this. And I also want to wish Professor Haverkamp a happy birthday and to wish Professor Haverkamp and Mrs. Haverkamp many healthy and enjoyable years. I also want to start by saying that this paper is part of an ongoing conversation with two colleagues who are both here, so I feel the need to acknowledge them. One is Professor Ivan Marcus, and the other is Professor Rami Reiner. Ivan has been a mentor and teacher for many years, and Rami a colleague and partner in study, especially at the National Library, and I thank both of them for many years of ongoing conversations, which will certainly continue after this talk today. Wail and cry charity, and the pious should weep bitterly, for your mother has broken, your parent has fallen, and the poor lack support, and those who study the Torah are in fear for lack of the praiseworthy mistress. Marat Yocheved, daughter of Rabbi Yechiel, son of Rabbi Ephraim, who marveled in her deeds, building synagogues and cemeteries in many communities, as well as other charities, and also surrounded the cemetery with a high wall here, and now she has been gathered to God, justice has been buried with her, and we have come to bury her, etc. This epitaph from 13th century Worms describes a woman about whom absolutely nothing is known. According to the epitaph, she was the daughter of a rabbi who was the son of another rabbi, and they must have been fairly important as both fairly extraordinarily were noted on the tombstone. Yocheved's wealth is also evident in the length of the verses at the opening of the epitaph, as well as from the donations she reportedly made during her lifetime to community institutions. Two important issues emerge from this epitaph. The first is the connection between the living and the dead. The founding of synagogues and cemeteries are noted, almost one could say, in the same breath, equating between the donations to both institutions. This deep connection between the daily life of medieval Jews and the cemetery, the metaphorical and theological Beit HaChayim, is one that has been demonstrated for the lives of medieval Jews, as well as for their Christian neighbors, and will be my point of departure for my talk today. The second issue I wish to address is that the donor, being praised here so highly, is a woman. While we are used to be, think of men as patrons and founders, or even as couples as donors, few sources refer to women as sole donors. This rarity is reflected in different iterations of this very epitaph. The version of the epitaph I am showing you was published by Max Grunwald in the Revue des Etudes Juifs in 1938. When Michael Broke looked at the tombstone, it was far less decipherable. Nevertheless, in a private correspondence, Broke suggested to me that Yocheved was not the donor, rather her father's work. And that is why they are mentioned here, because it is doubtful a woman could have donated so much money. My talk today will relate to this dilemma. What can be learned from epitaphs about gendered expectations and roles? My talk will have three parts. I will begin by positioning cemeteries, and especially tombstones, in our understanding of medieval Jewish life, raising points for more questions rather than answers. Then I will examine the gendered information on the epitaphs. Finally, I will end with a specific example of implications of such an investigation, focusing on what I will call tombstone chassidim. In a longer version, I have explored the limits of this commemorative genre of epitaphs, and I am happy to discuss this in the questions and answers, but I won't have time for it now, and thus I will focus on the evidence. Let us return to Marat Yochevet's epitaph. She is recorded as enabling the creation of a synagogue and a cemetery, and building a wall around the cemetery. As is well known, and in contrast to Christian communities, in which the cemetery was within the local churches, the synagogue and cemetery were not in the same location, as you can see here in Speyer and in Worms. Nevertheless, both were part of the local Jewish topography, and the Jews of medieval urban settings would go to the cemetery as part of their ritual, whether on new moons or at other moments in the annual cycle, as Lutia Raspe has shown. The locality of these customs, and indeed the ties between communities and their local dead, are most important. The ethical will of Judah the pious suggests that if one goes to pray in a different city, the local dead will be angry, connecting between synagogue and cemetery as places of prayer. The existence of both synagogues and cemeteries was often negotiated as part of privilege and tax agreements. Cemeteries reflected the connections between Jews and the local bishop or ruler, perhaps more than any other spatial aspect of their living conditions. As some sources report, the allotment of cemetery grounds as part of the bishop's own property, as we can hear in the case of Speyer, or the purchase of cemeteries from authorities, as in the case of Würzburg. They reflect locality in another way as well. For example, in Mainz, we know the tombstones of both Jews and Christians were made of the same red sandstone. And here I really want to just point to a future idea that I didn't do for today, but I've been playing with this database 
for many, many hours, which contains inscriptions from all over Germany, and actually you can find them by place, and you can see similarities both in shape, in style, and sometimes even in content. Yet beyond local considerations, cemeteries were also reflective of Jewish regional alliances, as places that had no cemetery had to rely on neighboring communities. Finally, the cemetery as a place of eternal rest had deep religious significance, symbolizing and embodying Jewish identity in a way I would argue is truly unparalleled in any other space of medieval Jewish life. Outside the cemetery, Jews and Christians were often in each other's spaces. In the cemetery, only Jews were buried. I move now to the individuals memorialized on the tombstones and to the values of the societies to which they belonged as reflected on them. Interest in medieval Jewish epitaphs first produced a significant body of research in the late 19th and early 20th century. My database, so to speak, for my talk today is a more recent collection of epitaphs, and I am most grateful to Michael Broke and his team for Epidat, and to Karl Heinz Muller, Shimon Schwarzfuchs, and Rami Reiner for their work on Wurzburg. I will focus on the tombstones, tombstones from the early 12th century till the mid 14th century from the Schum communities, mainly from Worms, and I will compare them to Wurzburg along the way. This is a trove of over a thousand stones, although most of them are partial. These different studies have focused on a wide variety of questions. They have identified important people who lived in the communities, sought details of events recorded on the tombstones, and analyzed the names used by medieval Jews. Rami Reiner, whose recent work is the most extensive, has analyzed the honorific titles used on the tombstones, such as rabbi, cantor, and midwife, as well, well as formulas of commemoration and beliefs in the afterlife. However, almost no attention has been paid to the adjectives used to describe the dead. If we return to Marat Yocheved, she is described as mehulelet, literally praiseworthy. Marat Yocheved is not the only woman in Worms referred to by this adjective. Similarly, Marat Sara, an old woman at the time of her death, is referred to in the same way. Unlike Yocheved, it is unclear why Sara merited this praise. Three other women from Worms are also described as mehulala, further enforcing this choice. With an eye to gender differences, mehulalet or mehulala might be expected to be a praise for women, as it is based on Proverbs 31, a God-fearing woman should be praised, isha yirat Hashem hititalal. Yet it is not reserved for women alone. David Barlevi of Worms, killed in 1184, is described as pleasant and praiseworthy. Here too we can hear of an event of everyday life, a violent death by bad people, Zedim, presumably non-Jews. Mihulal or mihulelet is just one adjective, and perhaps it is more characteristic of women. Yet there are other adjectives as well. David is also called a gentle man or a pleasant man. As part of my work, I have compiled a running list of such adjectives, comparing between their use for men and women. And I hope you can see this chart. The black numbers are from Worms, and the red numbers are from Würzburg. As is evident from this chart, there are some ambivalences in different cases, but in others, the gendered language is very evident. Women are hagunot, decent, and important, chashuva, more than they are generous. They are modest, whereas men are humble. Yet they are also pure, pious, and rich, righteous, if not like the men, then in comparable numbers. The relative parity between the adjectives describing men and women is augmented by the lack of parity when comparing honorifics, as Reiner has demonstrated. Men bore many titles, Parnas, Chaver, Chacham, Rabbeinu, Sofer, Darshan, whereas women were midwives and prayer leaders, but no more. As many of the terms Reiner listed refer to actual communal roles, this is evidence of the different activities men and women assumed in their lives. But what of those who were not the leaders? After all, most Jewish men were not rabbis, scribes, or parnasim. When looking at the adjectives, it would seem that despite some differences, men and women are described in similar terms. Adjectives are hard to go by and are less common on the tombstones than just lists with names or just names that are listed. Yet these adjectives tell us about the values of the community and are the only descriptions we have of so many individuals. So I want to turn to this body of evidence, as limited as it is, and ask, were expectations for men and women so different? Based on what we saw just a moment ago, perhaps not. Compare Marat Miriam, who died in 1247, and she did good deeds, and Rabbi Brachia ben Moshe, who died in 1300. They performed generic good deeds. 
However, some epitaphs provide more detail concerning these good deeds themselves. Isaac, the son of Eleazar from Worms, was of priestly descent. He was a true and honest man in his deeds and thought. He walked in the path of God with love. He worshiped God with a full heart of adoration, held the hand of the poor, went to the synagogue morning and night with a full soul. Yaakov ben Yosef of Worms, who died in 1289, was knowledgeable in Talmud and Nevi'im. Guta, the daughter of Avraham, was righteous and pure. She was pleasant and did many good deeds. She woke up early to fulfill commandments and fulfilled them until she went to sleep. Her tombstone is only partial, so I can't tell you what else she did. Different stones list a variety of activities, attendance of synagogue as well as charity or visiting the sick. Here, too, we, here too, we see both men and women commemorating, commemorated, I'm sorry, doing these deeds. Surprisingly, more women than men are listed as going to the synagogue devoutly. The only activity the men did more than women is study Torah. And most of those listed as practicing piety in the synagogue and with the poor are not mentioned as Torah scholars. Men don't have an upper hand on devotion to God either. For example, I'm sorry, Marat Rivka of Worms, who died in 1160, is described as a happy and encircled woman, devout in her love of the Torah, and also modest and shining in all commandments, and loyal with her entire soul to her creator. Or a different Marat Rivka, also from Worms, was described as pious and quick to observe commandments, to welcome guests, and to do good deeds. This type of vocabulary has served to date to describe learned Jewish rabbis, not unknown members of Jewish society. Yet the tombstones demonstrate that these adjectives were too common to be ascribed only to exceptional individuals. I hope that up to this point, I have convinced you of a relative gender parity with the obvious exception of Torah learning. This parity suggests that many mundane religious activities, the everyday pious practices of upstanding men and women in the community who were not necessarily learned, were not so different for men and women, a matter I argued in my recent book, Practicing Piety. But perhaps this conclusion can be pushed a step further. Our understanding of medieval Jewish life is based primarily on the halachic writings that have reached us. The heroes of those compositions are most often the rabbis themselves and their close circle of adherents. One can only wonder how their values reflect those of the community at large. I want to tentatively suggest that these epitaphs can push us to re-examine some of the commonplace assumptions that can be found in scholarship concerning Jewish practice. Due to time constraints, I will relate today only to one adjective, the adjective chassid or chassida. Yesterday, Ivan Marcus discussed the way the pendulum has swung over the past century between seeing chassidei Ashkenaz as a pietistic separatist sect, seeing them as a social movement, a group, or at the very least, a select circle. Marcus distinguished between the pietists and the pious, a distinction I have also made in my own work. He was interested in the pietists. I, in contrast, am interested in the pious. Rami Reiner, in his study of Würzburg, cautiously argued that although the term chassid need not denote only those who belong to the pietist circles, in his opinion, it is possible that those on the Würzburg stones did. There are six male tombstones from the 13th century on which the term appears, and Rami noted that these would have been made during the intense years of pietistic activity in Würzburg if there was such a movement. He further dates the term, suggesting that in pre-13th century, chassid was used for all, and by the late 13th century, it was perhaps going out of fashion. But to the, um, the mid-13th century people, it denoted those who were linked closely to the teachings of Rabbi Judah ben Samuel and Rabbi Elazar of Worms. A central line in his argument is that no women from Würzburg are described as pious on their tombstones. This follows Judith Baskin's suggestion from almost two <coughs> decades ago that no women are called chassidot in Sefer Chassidim, and thus no woman could be part of Chassidei Ashkenaz. However, the Shum tombstones, as you can see here, contain 10 women called chassidot, and only two male chassidim. Looked at time-wise, they range from the mid-12th century to the early 14th century, and I only brought two men and two women here to give you examples so that you could see it. I can't fit them all onto the slide. Surely we would be hard-pressed to say Rabbi Elazar of Worms held no sway during these years in Shum. These chassidot joined Dolce, Elazar's wife, who was repeatedly called chassidah in the elegy he himself wrote for her. 
Judith Baskin, in fact, suggested that perhaps Dolce was a pietist, and that's why she, be, she could be called Hasida. But I want to suggest to you that she was pious, like other women in her community who were also called Hasida. In other words, Hasid or Hasida, in, as a social category and in common social usage, did not mean pietist, but meant pious to medieval people. Following this, I would venture another step. A few decades ago, Gerard Nahon published a group of epitaphs from Alsace. Here we meet another Hasida, Marat Bruna Bat Moshe, who was both Hashuva and Hasida. She died in 1223. The term Hasid or Hasida, like the other adjectives I noted before, are not just found on tombstones. They are found in the Tatnu Chronicles, written in the 12th century, in poetry and exegesis, and in scriptures inscriptions as well as in stories. Yesterday, Professor Marcus suggested that scholars who read Sefer Hasidim can only use the stories freely if they remember that they were meant for the select circle of pietists. Here I wish respectfully to differ from him. In our word of scholarship, in which each source is precious, precious it seems to me unfortunate to dismiss one of the largest repositories of the medieval Jewish world. Moreover, as scholars of medieval Christian tales have taught us, even if written for a select circle, stories reflect a far wider mentality. Like any source, they must be used with caution. So as a final step, I wish to turn to stories and examine the way the word Hasid is used in them. I would argue that even in Sefer Hasidim, the word Hasid does not always mean pietist. But in the interest of time, I will turn to a different collection of stories and to a different geography that I just started hinting at, that of Sefer Hamasim, copied in medieval Champagne, that contains multiple references to Hasidim. And here I want to congratulate my colleague, Professor Rela Kushalevsky, whose edition is forthcoming this fall. Many stories in this manuscript refer to an abstract and nameless hero, identified as a Hasid. And here are two examples. The Hasid hero is not characterized by the study of Torah, nor by the extreme observance of commandments, but rather by charity practices and prayer habits. As you can see here, and I'll just read once. One, once there was a Hasid who used to recite the three prayers every day, and his prayers would rise before the divine throne like a daily sacrifice placed upon the altar. And then the story goes on. The Hasid hero in Sefer Ma'asim can be rich or poor, learned or not, but mainly he goes to the synagogues and attains, attends prayers loyally. He loves God, much like the men and women from Shum we just saw. It is no coincidence in my mind that when looking at a far elitist source than those examined to date, such as tombstones that literally represent all the members of the community and these stories, we understand the term Hasid in a very different way than the pietist understanding scholars have promoted over the past hundred years. Such a corrective is significant in my eyes as it allows us to de the development of new paradigms that are far more inclusive of other members of the Jewish community. So I returned to Marat Yocheved, whose death was mourned by Hasidim. Despite the doubts expressed regarding her financial wherewithal, I think I can safely say that research on women's lives, that of Avraham Grossman, Judith Baskin, my own work, and others such as Rachel First, whom we heard yesterday, make it more than plausible that she did indeed donate the money to the synagogue and the cemetery. In a similar fashion, I suggest that we take these epitaphs seriously, seriously when trying to understand piety, good deeds, and perhaps even pietism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisheva, for this brilliant talk and you cut time. So we have time for questions. Professor Marcus. I did not say what you think I said. <laughs> <laughs> When the stories themselves, I think, in a social setting, or as it's in Laban, seem to be directed at a small group in their original context, they still use the, the real world of everyday Jewish piety as part of the stuff of the stories. So I agree that they transmit both. They transmit a narrow point of view to their immediate audience, as far as I can reconstruct it, and they use the whole world of the Jewish world of Ashkenaz and the plus values which are taken for granted, which need not in any way be equated with the tiny, narrow group that I think 
was functionally telling the stories and receiving them. So I agree with you. Why how could we throw out 600 stories and not be? The other question I have about you, though, is for you is, and this is a wonderful body of data. Is there any correlation or disagreement with the descriptions that we find in the many names in the memoir book here that describe the Jews who died in the various uh, persecutions? We do have some adjectives there. Is it worthwhile perhaps comparing the stones and their languages with the uh, manuscripts, which are supposed to be of individuals as a, as a large corpus? So, so I f um, thank you very much for that question. First of all, what a relief. Because then I obviously misunderstood you yesterday. Uh, but second of all, um, I think I would say that um, as for looking at other sources and trying to understand from other sources, other I'm, I'm just at the beginning of this. Every time I open a source now, I see this all of a sudden. And I see these words popping up again, and I try to understand what they mean. In the memorable, and I've done work on the names of the men and women very extensively, the m most of the descriptions we have are Haskena, Habachura. So we have age descriptions. We don't have so many um, character adjectives that describe personality. Very rarely, actually, unless they're really heavy donors. Um, and the other thing I would say is that one of the things I think we need to do is correlate between <coughs> adjectives, I'm sorry, and age. In other words, a young person will often be naim. An old person will often be chassid. And I think these are different things that we have to think more about in order to understand. And I think that's something that we can continue doing as we look at these sources. Yes, there was a comment here, a yeah. short comment. OK, about the mehulele, the mehula. I, I think that, the, that, that these adjectives are further uh, referencing uh, verses in Sefer Yirmiya that are read at the end of Haftarah. Uh, Al yitalel chacham b'chachmato, v'al yitalel gibor b'shvorato. Okay. I think that, uh, but I agree with you that I think that by the woman that, that it's also referencing the, 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 the verse in Asia file, but uh, the, these verses I think also are, are being referenced by this. Uh, okay, so I'll criticize myself, and I'll just say that the two men who I found who are called Mehulal um, are actually two men who were killed by Zedim. And I think that might not be a coincidence as well. So I think there's more to look for. I was trying to find a word that I could very clearly kind of transmit my gendered perspective, which is why I chose this, because we have some women who are even referred to as Eshet Chayel Mehulelet. So I wanted to put them together here. You're right, of course, that there are other references. But I would also want to think more um, further about the fact that the people, who, the men who are called um, Hulal are also killed by Zedim. So I think there's something interesting going on there. I will also just say, as far as social life is concerned, that there are so many people killed, and Rami can probably confirm this, there are so many people killed by Zedim who are mentioned as such on their tombstones, not Kedoshim, who were killed as part of anti-Jewish events, but actually people killed by crime or by uh, accident or whatever it was. And I think that's also something we can learn from these tombstones. This was just 20 minutes. Yes, you said just, uh, just have a question. Did you find any Havera? I found one. Uh, so I have not found any Havera, and I'd love to hear about the Havera. You found? Uh, I, I cannot tell you more. I just <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm working Where is on, she? on the Parisian Epitaph right now, and the French Epitaph in general. And I found one, until now, one Havera mentioned as a woman. All the rest are for men only. So I was wondering maybe if you found one of them. But I'll tell you more if I find something. Okay, great. Another question, please? Yeah. Um, Alicia, I just wanted to ask you, do you think that, that some of these are just formulas that they use all the time? Like later uh, uh, donations on, you know, Judaica, on Harakot, things that are formulas that they always use. The, the man is always a Rav Rebbe or a Haver, a Rav. So I was wondering if some of these are just standard things. So somebody might think I paid you because I was waiting for that question. Um, I think that the formulaic aspects here are very important. And here I want to say a, a word that I couldn't fit into my paper about the people who were deciding on these verses. Because, of course, every person who dies isn't capable of going and deciding what to write on their own tombstone. So there has to have been somebody who they went to who gave them that advice. So I would suggest that there are some stock phrases. But I think that what we see, because money is also a constraint, how much you can carve on the stone, how rich you are, what you want to say, I think we can see a lot of personal expression as well. And that's something I've actually spoken about with Professor Broca at great length, because you can also sometimes see a lot of emotion and love on these tombstones. So there might be stock phrases. And clearly, these people don't speak Hebrew in their daily life. So if they choose 
תמימה, ישרה, נדיבה, או נדיב, או whatever it is, they're going on someone else's say of what is the best. But at the same time, we only have fragments. Somebody could turn this study completely upside down. You see, I'm very good at criticizing myself. But somebody could turn this study completely upside down if we found 500 more tombstones, because we have such a small number to go on. All we can hope for is that what we have here is representative of what there is. But I think that we can see some choice here, and certainly in the longer ones, like the ones we saw of those Marot Rivka, who I was so happy to find these twin Rebekas, and we can see there that someone really thought long about what to say about them, even if they were using formulas. That's why I think, and I have not succeeded so far, and I've spent really hours on the Inschriften website, because a lot of the, the um, Inschriften there are also uh, other dedication formulas, and we really need to do a fuller study. I mean, we have the dedication formulas from the synagogues as well in the Shum communities, and they contain these same words. So I think we really have to do a much broader study, both within Jewish culture, but also comparing to Christian culture and see what kind of phrases were used, what were considered good adjectives. So far, and I made this comment in the paper, I see a huge difference between the way Jews commemorated their dead and Christians commemorated their dead, even with the phrases, because of the religious difference. And that's why I said, I think perhaps I have finally found a very Jewish space. Not to say that there weren't rituals adapted and adopted from the outside concerning the dead, but that this is a place where the Jewish world comes most forcefully across, and I'll just give one last example, and that is in the way the dates are noted, and the days of the week, and the importance given to Jewish festivals. I think we really have a look at an internal Jewish time schedule. And this, to me, is very, very exciting when looking at these epitaphs, and I think it has a lot of potential. Thank you very much. We have no more time. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Before I begin, uh, it's a great honor to be part of these sessions in honor of Professor Haverkamp, and uh, we would like to wish him many more years of health and of happiness. <laughs> Isaac of Corbet, the late 13th century French author of the Sefer Mitzvot Katan, was a halachist, but one with the soul of a chassid. He was a person, I believe, who sought out additional religious and ethical obligations beyond the basic halachic norms that bound all Jews together. Already his students referred to him as a chassid. One can see this quite clearly from some of the late 13th century and early 14th century manuscripts. For example, this uh, artistic final page of the book um, from, Oxford University, from Oxford Library which includes the scribal colophon, which reads, Hasefer Yasad Harab Rabbi Yitzchak HaChasid HaAnav, the book written by Isaac the Pious and the Humble. Or these lines from an early 14th century manuscript, one that Colette Sirat would love, and we saw this manuscript together, um, as it is a perfect example of what she spoke about earlier this week. The text is from Isaac's introductory letter we will be speaking about shortly. In the opening, in the opening line you see, this is the letter, Igeret, of the HaChasid, our master, Rabbeinu, Rav, Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Yitzchak of Korbei. And at its end, which is the left side, uh, this was written by our teacher, HaChasid, from the city of Korbei, Rav Isaac, the son of, Rab, of Joseph. I should clarify from the outset that when talking about Isaac as a pietist, everyone's going to be doing this today, you realize. When talking about Isaac as a pietist or about his pietistic ideals, my meaning is that he shares a certain affinity with the German pietists, Hasid Ashkenaz, as Ephraim Karnafogel has shown. This does not mean that he had to agree with all that they believed in. For example, I don't see, I don't see any indication that he adopted their Cheshbon HaTevot approach to the prayer and for good reason. I may add, I'm sorry, I may add, and since Isaac did not uh, leave behind a work devoted to Hasidut, one can only surmise that his approach was somewhat similar to works like Sefer Hasidut or Chaye Olam, which pro were probably also written in Northern France. Isaac, like these authors, felt free to pick and choose what he admired and ignore or modify what he did not. Today, 
I would like to demonstrate one way in which I believe Isaac integrated his pietistic ideals within the practical handbook of Jewish law that he wrote. And since the title of my talk is Piety for the People, I will not be focusing on the body of the work, its halachic section, but rather on the list of commandments that usually appears at the head of the work. This simple and short text had more of a chance of being read by many people, even unlearned ones, in contrast to the halachic work, which as, sim as simplified as it was, still required a certain level of Talmudic proficiency in order to be understood. Let me explain. Isaac's book, commonly knows, known by its acronym SMAK, or as he titled it, Amudei Gola, Pillars of Exile, was completed circa 12, uh, 1277. It was structured as a two-part work. The first part was the innovative list of commandments divided into seven pillars. The second part was the commentary on that list, which was the body of the work, its halachic section. This much longer and detailed section generally followed the order of, of the commandments of the list. It is, however, worth noting that not all the commandments were comment up commented upon. This can be seen most dramatically at the end of the list, where one finds a large number of prohibitions dealing with sexual relations that appear only in the list, but do not make an appearance in the book itself. Although, in some early manuscripts, and this seems to be a later development, there was a move to integrate the two sections, and then these commandments were brought into the body as well, but again, without any commentary. Now, most people who glance at the opening pages of the smock for the first time, meaning at its list of commandments, will assume that this list of mitzvot was merely a table of contents, rimazim, simanim, to the halachic work that follows it. In the same way, Eliezer of Metz or Moses of Kutzi placed a list of commandments at the head of their work. No one would stop to consider that this list actually had its own function and its own inherent religious value. However, after reading the testimony given by Isaac's students, transcribed by a certain Isaac of Strasbourg during the end of the 13th century, and then rereading Isaac's own introductory letter that he circulated among the communities of France, it became, becomes clear that there was something significant at play. Isaac himself tells us in his letter that he divided his list of commandments into seven pillars equal to seven days of the week so that every Jew would, would read and, uh, or I will add possibly chant from memory a different pillar of mitzvot each day, completing the entire list on a weekly basis. His students even maintained that he meant this recital to take the place of or be equal to the daily recital of Psalms, a custom we shall be hearing about very shortly. This line, okay, added by the scribe of Nim 26 to introduce the list, captures nicely the author's expectations, and I quote, these are the commandments that our master and teacher, Rabbi Isaac ben Joseph, has established to be recited each day of the seven days of the week, suitably explained and in a clear language so that the reader may read them quickly. The list, which, which includes both biblical and rabbinic mitzvot, is restricted to those relevant to Jews living in medieval Europe. It does not contain, for example, the commandments performed in the land of Israel and the temple. And in this, he differs not only from Maimonides, but also of his Franco-German predecessors, Eliezer of Metz and Moses of Kusi. He therefore has only about 323 commandments on his list and not 613. Isaac's presentation of the list of commandments in most entries to the list is straightforward and not too exciting. I originally wrote boring, but maybe not too exciting. Each entry contains the basic brief definition of the commandment, followed by its biblical proof text. So, for example, commandment number nine, I've chosen on purpose a strange mitzvot that no one else counts, so you should get a flavor of his pietism. 
piety, pietism. Okay, pietism. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, for example, uh, Commandment 9 is to circumcise the foreskin of one's heart. As it is written, you shall circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. When the derivation is not self-explanatory in Isaac's eyes, he will add the Talmudic understanding of the verse to clarify the issue. So, here we have to pray with intent. That's, again, a pietistic element, with intent. He adds part of the definition, kavana. Uh, as written, you shall serve him with all your heart. And... They, the Talmudic sages, have expounded what is the service of the heart. This refers to prayer. At times, however, he will add brief comments beyond this basic template. They will either be rabbinic expansions of the commandment to include aspects beyond the obvious, such as commandment five, to fear the Holy One, blessed be he, as written, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, our sages expounded the, or the et, to include Talmudic scholars. And more of interest, he will add at times his own understandings or definitions of the mitzvah, such as commandment two on this slide, to acknowledge the unity of the name of God, as it is written, Hear, O Israel. This refers to acceptance of the yoke of the kingship of heaven. It is only very rarely that he expounds upon a topic beyond these type of brief comments that we have just seen. In these somewhat lengthier treatments, he will either add some practical laws or theoretical comments relating to the counting of the commandments. Such places are limited to about five out of the entire list of 300 plus commandments. In short, the list in its entirety was one that could have been easily recited by a very broad segment of the population in the 13th century, who may not have been trained to understand Hebrew but who were taught to read and recite the basic liturgical texts, such as the Chumash and the Siddur. And even those who could not even develop these minimal skills should have been able to memorize the short texts through repetition in the same way they memorize the daily prayers. Ephraim Kanafogel. Okay. So, why is this seemingly uninteresting list so important to Isaac? In fact, it was so important then according to his students, Isaac and his colleagues fasted several days so that a person should receive reward when he reads the daily section of the commandments as if he were reading from the book of Psalms. So what exactly was its religious significance? And why did he feel that all Jews must recite the entire list every week? Fortunately for me, Isaac explains the rationale, or at least hints to it, behind his takana in the inter in, uh, introductory letter that he circulated to the, among the Jewish communities of France together with his work. It is there that he wrote, I have therefore recorded these commandments that are obli an obligation in these times in seven pillars corresponding to the seventh day of the week, and I ask that each person recite one pillar every day in order that one should gain benefit from God. Leman yitav lo. He continues, for there, are, for there are many commandments that a person is not obligated to perform until the opportunity presents itself. However, should he read them and resolve in his heart to fulfill them, the Holy One, blessed be he, ascribes it to him as if he had performed them. And this reward is infinitely great. V'zeh hasachar gadol verav. An echo of this theme can be heard in his poetical, poetic authorial colophon, which ser ther serves as the coda to the work, where he writes, And may it be his will that it be pleasant, like a bundle of myrrh, for each individual Jew to say, each and every day the allotted section of it, so that God should bestow his goodness. I believe what Isaac appears to be saying is the following. In addition to the actual performance of the mitzvot, which is the more regular way to accumulate merit and reward from God, there is also merit and reward for mere acceptance of and commitment to those very commandments, should one lack the opportunity, means, or ability to fulfill them. Isaac here seems to recognize the centrality of the heart in addition to that of action. 
he believed that by introducing a liturgical list of commandments, he was giving all Jews the opportunity to gain merit through an acceptance of each one of these commandments that were uttered, even if the Jew was unable to actually fulfill them for whatever reason. Let's take, for example, the commandments of Tfilin, Tzitzit, and Mezuzah that two members on this panel have written about at length. Many, <laughs> if you can guess who that is, okay. <laughs> Many medieval Jews um, did not fulfill them, even in northern France, because of various legitimate reasons. However, by pronouncing the mitzvah and its biblical source, they would at least be an oral and hopefully also an internal commitment to these commandments, even if in practice they were not implemented. In addition, Isaac may have also had a more long-term long motivation, and I believe he does allude to this motivation as well, but we won't go into that, that the ritualistic recital of all the commandments pertinent to medieval Jews would lead to a greater awareness of Jewish law, which would then motivate some to increase their knowledge and actually observe the law. That was also important. Okay. Isaac, in his letter, does not explicitly mention the basis for his belief, that commitment alone is meritorious. However, his students do point to a Talmudic statement in Kiddushin 40a as his source. They somewhat rephrased the language of Isaac's letter and then added its source. I quote, he and his colleagues considered that there were commandments that a person will, not, will never be able to fulfill. And were a person to see them in writing, he would at least resolve to fulfill them. And as the rabbis taught, Kiddushin, the Holy One, blessed be he, combines good intentions with the deed. Mitzaref machshava lemaseh. The Talmudic statement reads like this. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God combines good intention with the deed. For it is written, Malachi, then they that feared the Lord spoke one with, an, with another, and the Lord listened and heard. And a book of remembrance was written, did I, yeah, I'm there, right? The book of remembrance was written before him for those that feared the Lord and those that thought upon his name. Ulechoshve Shemo, thought, remember that, Ulechoshve Shemo, thought upon his name. The Talmud continues. Now, what is the meaning of that thought, of, of, of that thought upon his name? Said Rav Asi, even if one thinks of performing a precept, precept, but is prevented against his will from fulfilling it, the verse ascribes to him credit as though he has performed it. Clearly, Isaac or his students were being liberal or expansive in their understanding of Rav Asi's phrase, v'ne'enas, prevented against one's will, to include a much wider variety of scenarios, not only being prevented by some outside force, but other legitimate forms of non-observance. Alternatively, one can argue that they focus their attention upon the opening lines of this Talmudic source, find already in Tosefta and Yerushalmi, without Ravasi's comments, which seems to make the case for thought and commitment being worthy in the eyes of God as something that God writes down in the Book of Remembrance. And although I believe that the students were correct in pointing to this Talmudic passage as Isaac's ultimate and authoritative source, and one can hear echoes of this source in his, in his, work, in his own formulations, it is not the complete story. There is an additional source worth considering much closer to Isaac in time, which seems to have inspired Isaac to go in this direction. It appears in one of the most famous passages in Sefer Chassidim, and to be precise, it's in the section of the work attributed to Shmuel HaChassid. Most people will recall the opening of this source, the tale of a man who was a shepherd and did not know how to pray. Every day he said, Master of the world, let it be known to you that if you owned animals and would give them to me to watch, for everyone else I watch for hire, but for you I would watch for free because I love you. And the passage ends, and he was a Jew. <laughs> Some will recall the heavenly rebuke of the scholar who stopped the simple Jew from praying in this very odd way. And the scholar saw in a night dream where he was told, if you don't tell him 
that, what he, that he should say what he used to be saying before you came to him, and should you not go, know that evil will befall thee, for you have stolen from me someone from Olam Haba. However, what most, most people usually do not notice is that this tale is framed by two theological statements before and after the tale. Before the story, in paragraph 4, we find the following. Any commandment that a person can do, he should do so. However, if he's unable to realize it, he should think about doing it. Yachshov la'asot. The author then presents the story of the ignorant shepherd as an example of this religious principle. Kimaseh ba'adam echad shuhu ro'e behemot, as the story is told about. At the completion of the tale, the pietist returns to his general principle. So in this case... There was no Torah and no religious acts. However, he thought to do good, and he accomplished a great thing, because God demands the heart, Rahmana libabai. Therefore, a person should think proper thoughts for the service, uh, in the service of God. Here, I believe, we can see exactly where Isaac is coming from. He has simply taken a concept, a pietistic principle of Rahman Ali Babai and Yachshov Machshavot Tovot, to think proper thoughts, found already in Sefer Hasidim, and has given it form and content by creating a list of commandments to be recited or chanted by all Jews, learned and unlearned alike, and on a daily basis. His idea was that by reciting these commandments, and more importantly, having the necessary internalization and commitment, something religiously significant was already accomplished, even if the commandment was not at all relevant to that particular person, or it was unable to be fulfilled due to some legitimate reason. Finally, Judith, I have some time? Yes, you do. No I would, problem. I would like to end my presentation with a quick look at the Parma manuscript itself. And to note something that the original editor of the work failed to note. As one can see quite clearly in the manuscript, you can all see it, there are three glosses on the text that all seem to me to be in, this, in the same hand. And I have Judith here who's going to tell me I'm wrong, but no. to me it seems to be all in the same hand. Um, those above the line were integrated into the body of the printed text, as you can see. And I've put them in bold, uh, as you can see on the top. The third, found in the margin, was ignored completely, not even mentioned in the notes. And what is written there? Let's take a closer look. As you can see, it is a brief but clear reference to the Talmudic passage in Kiddushin, which we quoted above. It says, as it is written in Malachi, and those that thought upon his name. The exact verse that was the proof text for the Talmudic teaching in Kiddushin, that God combines good intentions with the deed. I agree it would not be easy to ascertain whether these words were added early on by the author, editor of the work, or much later by some learned reader. Um, note that in the Boski, that's how it's pronounced, Boski? Boski manuscript of this text, these words do not appear, whereas the other two glosses are part of the text. Nevertheless, I do find it heartening that both the actual students of the Smak, whom we saw above, and someone related to Sefer Hasidim, realized long before me that there may be some connection between these two texts and the statement found in Shrakte Kiddushin. Thank you very much. particular result, you said that the Kalev Chavana, and you labeled that a pietistic influence. But the uh, Chazal is replete with sources uh, that speak of Sfirah Chavana. And also with uh, the Shema, Kabbalah Malchut Shemaim, there too, Chazal uh, is replete with the labelings of, Shema, of Shema's Kabbalah Malchut Shemaim. So there's no original yeah. labelings over there. Fine. No, you're right, 100%. Uh, but but my, I suppose I should have elaborated, but the 20 minutes don't allow. Um, my point regarding tefillah b'kavana is not 
really that he quotes those words or uses those words, but in the smak structure of the work, uh, as opposed to Kriyat Shema, which is found in the section relating to Dibur, Tefillah is found in the section of the heart. Got that? It's not merely Tefillah but Kavana. It become, Kavana becomes the major point of Tefillah. And in that sense, he is influenced by the Hasidim. And he actually quotes El Azar on that exact point. So that, that's why it wasn't clear, but there is reason to my madness, if I may say. Okay, regarding uh, Kriyat Shema, um, it's a similar thing. Um, he, 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 I, I, I was comparing, he, basically Kriyat Shema is divided into two commandments by the Smak because he has it in Dibor, which is Tefillah, but then he, but, uh, which is uh, saying of Kriyat Shema, saying of the Shema, but then he has uh, uh, Yichud Hashem, which is the first pillar, which is devoted to the heart, right? And there, his definition of Yichud Hashem as Kavalat Omu Chachamayim is unique when you compare him to his predecessors, whether it's Moshe Mikutsi, or Yireim, or of course the Rambam, which we won't get into right now. So there was some reason to my badness there as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Judith. There is a handout going around. I hope there are enough. You may have to share, but there should be enough. If not, it's going down both sides. I hope you're getting it. Uh, this talk has a lot of moving parts, and the handout will do two things. It will allow you to follow those parts. It may allow me to skip some stuff, and it might even allow me to go more slowly. So it's very valuable. <laughs> so hold on to it. Um, you, you could have left you know, the Todara Ba because I'd like to accept my thanks to all of the organizers, including the session organizers, the conference organi organizers. Uh, Jorge Muller was uh, on the floor. I'm glad you found the seat. I, I was, I, but you've taken away my joke line. I was going to say you've given a new definition to hard sa'ah, me'alefet or mitalefet. I don't know. Anyway, you don't have to go back. It's okay. Um, and of course, acharon, acharon, chavivim, really, uh, to the Haverkamps, to Professor and Mrs. Haverkamp. It's just wonderful to be with you. And uh, the words last night, uh, uh, really, it's, we were all filled with, with a lot of uh, emotion. And, uh, and here we've learned from you intellectually so much, but there's a wonderful couple behind all of that uh, uh, material as well, and to Professor Ava as well. Uh, it's been wonderful to be with you. And the best part is, uh, even though we're getting towards the end of the conference, the end of the session, uh, it's not uh, goodbye, it's lehit raot. Uh, I think I will see some of you very soon in uh, Mainz, Jerusalem, uh, Heidelberg, Jerusalem, so, uh, and you're welcome. We can, if there are questions that remain, we can cover them then. Krakow next year. Oh, okay, all right. I, see, they booked me before I know I'm going. Anyway, all right, set it. I guess so. Anyhow, okay. So here's what I want to do. Um, uh, I think if I say to people, well, when did Jews start saying to Helim sort of as prayers of, uh, for supplication, for problems, for tzarot, for troubles. Uh, some would say, you know, halacha uh, Moshe Sinai. Adam and Eve probably said them in Gan Eden, I don't know. Um, the fact is that by the early modern period, we have quite a bit of this. In fact, we know exactly what it's doing then. The question is, how does it start and how does it develop? Can't cover all of that in 20 minutes, even going as fast as I can. But I do want to talk today about the Ashkenazic contribution to that development. And as you'll see, this is very much a work in progress, so I'm hopeful that we'll get some more uh, help in that as well. So in order to give us a good picture of Ashkenaz, let's go right to Spain. Early on, that's okay, you'll see the context in a moment. Early on in his mid-14th century encyclopedia-like work of Jewish values and practices, Tzedal Derech, which was directed especially for this session, largely to readers from secondary elite or perhaps educated laity as well. Menachem ibn Zarach of Toledo recommends that one who wishes to make additional supplications after the fixed daily prayers, in light of any troubles that may have occurred, al kol tavo, is advised to read from the book of Psalms. Well, here we're in the mid to late 14th century. Toward the end of the work, in discussing the 10 days of penitence, Menachem recommends that one who wishes to offer praise to the Almighty each day should read the Psalms of David. And he points out, he almost says this as if he did it, that the book of Psalms is divided into seven parts, one section for each day of the work for this very purpose. Recitation of the Psalms also provides a reader whose daily Torah study is lacking with additional opportunity for fulfillment. And Menachem again alludes to the fact that this recitation will prove salutary toward providing 
whatever a person needs, l'chol tzarchei ha'adam. Given that Menachem's father, Aaron, was forced to flee France following the expulsion of the Jews in 1306, settling first family in Navarre and then in Castile, one wonders whether Menachem's recommendation, which is a very full one, it's one of the earliest full ones that we have, to recite additional psalms each day reflects an Ashkenazic or a Sephardic milieu. A passage in Yosef ibn Jukatilya's Kabbalistic work, Sharei Ora, suggests that reciting psalms will water various negative forces, while another from Avraham ben Arambam's Hamaspik of Dei Hashem stresses the value of reciting psalms as additional voluntary prayer, whether recited before the fixed prayers or afterward. Indeed, Maimonides himself, in a responsum, notes, doesn't approve necessarily, but notes a practice to read Mizmorei Tehillim or other prayers and supplications before the formal prayer service begins. Writing about a century before Menachem ibn Zerach, Yonah of Girona, who dies in 1263, advises in one of his works called Igeret Hachuva, a guide for daily religious observance with special emphasis on following a regimen of repentance, that a person should designate a place in his home in which to put a book of halachot or psalms or a sidur. The section in this work in which this instruction is found addresses the requirement specifically for a non-scholar to also study or at least encounter Torah texts each day via Digest of Jewish Law, a biblical book Mikra, such as Tehillim, or in passages from the Sidur. Indeed, reading of the book, from the Book of Psalms on the Sabbath served already during the Gaonic period as a means of providing opportunities for Torah study for the less learned. To be sure, I think Judah mentioned this too, or alluded to it, he didn't mention it, but he certainly alluded to it. Uh, to be sure, Rabbi Yonah studied at the Tosafist Academy at Evreux in northern France, and it is possible, indeed quite reasonable, this formulation in his Igeret HaTshuva reflects something that he either heard or thought about there. In fact, there are a number of sources from northern France and Germany, and here you can start to follow along, in northern France and Germany during the, tw- during the 13th century, which presume that the recitation of psalms is a regular addendum to the daily prayers. And thankfully, in Blachti Naset Chirim, the programmatic preface to Sefer Mitzvot Katan, in which uh, Isaac of Strasbourg interviewed Isaac of Corbeil's students, and as Judah again uh, talked about a little bit, um, says that Isaac of Corbeil divided his work on the commandments and its table of contents, which we heard so well about, into seven parts, so that people could study or at least recite each of these sections on a daily basis during the course of the week, and they quote, quote, in the same way that one reads the book of Tehillim. Moreover, Isaac of Corbeil, according to this, undertook a series of fasts, to allow people who read from his work uh, to be considered as if they were reading from Sefer T. Lim. People did this and so on. And here, there's one more line in that passage which is the most suggestive. Kidel Omram, this was done so that people would say these commandments, Dvaryom biomo alpi omro or ma'amaro bimkom, or perhaps bimakom, techinot bimakom kriyat Sefer T. Lim. All of these formulations presume that in northern France, at least by the second half of the 13th century, the daily recitation of psalms and various applications, in connection with the morning prayer service, was somewhat or perhaps even very common, and that at least some individuals complete the recitation of psalms each week in this way. The daily recitation of additional psalms before the prayers and beyond those found in the standard liturgy, such as the Psuche de Zimra, is strongly recommended in several passages in the German pietist Torah commentary composed during the mid-13th century by Ephraim ben Samson, and I'm pretty sure we can call him a pietist, l'chol adayot, but we can talk about that, although there is no indication I'm part of this problem too, so it's like I can make fun of myself also, uh, uh, as I've learned very nicely from the good job that Elisheva didn't give me such a wonderful talk and asking questions on herself, so I can ask questions on myself too. Although was no, there is no indication from Ephraim's commentary that this practice was, was widespread. In his commentary to the Book of Ruth, Yudah Hasid student Lazar of Orms, who dies around 1230 something, a colleague of Ephraim ben Samson notes that the gematria equivalent of King David's name, David, 14, is two times the letter, uh, Hebrew letter Zion, which hints, which has a value of seven, two times seven is 14, which hints that the recitation of the seven parts of Tehillim on the seven, each of the seven days of the week and the completion of the book every, uh, each week is to be attributed in some way to King David himself. A later 13th century rabbinic figure with affinity to the German pietists, uh, Victor Katz of Vienna maintains in his commentary to the Book of Ruth, and this follows what Ephraim ben Samson did, that there was a five-part division of the Book of Psalms, not seven but five, and both work. Uh, they're not uh, uh, contradictions, uh, which equates it to the five books of Moses that were given on Shavuot, the festival associated with the birth of King David as well. 
This teaches according to Avigda Katz that, quote, whoever recites the Psalms each day, it is as if he has fulfilled the entire Torah. And there are others who rely on a passage in Mirash Tehilim in which King David asked for the assurance that one who reads and ponders verses in the book of Psalms will be rewarded if, even if he is not learned, as if he studied the highly complex Mishnaic tractates of Nigaim ve'ohalot. And as well known, Midrash Tehilim itself is a well-known touchstone for Ashkenazic mystical teachings and other customs. All of this, the French piece, the German piece, bespeaks notable, notable support and even some actual evidence from Germany and northern France during the 13th century for reciting psalms, at least, or at least portions from it outside of the fixed liturgy for a variety of reasons or purposes. Devotional piety, additional prayer for one's needs, or as a vehicle for expanded Torah study. Sefer Min Hagtov, composed in Italy in the second half of the 13th century by a student of a student of a French Tosafist, perhaps due to Sir Leon of Paris, but again, a lot of Tosafistic material, French material comes in, refers not only to, to the custom of reciting selections from the Psalms following the afternoon prayers on the Sabbath, but also the, to the practice to recite each day before the regular prayers, and this is something new, the 15 so-called gradual psalms, or psalms of a center pilgrimage, shirei amalot, a practice to which we shall return. If we move it forward a little bit, period after the Black Death, leading Ashkenazic authorities such as Avigda Kara, Yisrael Isseline recited psalms each day and advised others to do so. And again, from this early modern period, we all of a sudden have quite a bit of evidence. So what's happening just before that, I think, is critically important. In a recent study on the production of Jewish Bibles in medieval Europe, David Stern notes that a large number of personal psalters were produced for Jews in Italy during the 15th century. Many were produced there even earlier. Stern indicates that the numbers from Spain for these psalm books are also signif significantly higher than those produced in Ashkenaz, although he presents little specific evidence for Ashkenaz. It also remains unclear as to whether the Ashkenazic texts of Sefer Tehillim that were produced were intended uh, primarily to allow the recitation by individuals, and obviously the size, shape of the manuscripts will matter, but that has to be considered, or whether they are principally for use on behalf of the community. Copies of the daily liturgy for individual members of the congregation who were not wealthy, and even for the prayer leader himself, were largely unavailable until well into the 13th century, if not beyond, when the high costs and technical problems associated with this kind of literary production were apparently overcome in Ashkenaz as well. And I'll tell you, Katrin, that I have another source about the High Holy Day prayers, an additional one that wasn't in that study. So I can give you that too. So it's all still, uh, sometimes I find out that I was wrong, but sometimes I find out that I was right, uh, although my children will never admit it. In any case, <laughs> The Psalter's piece here, about a dozen manuscripts of the complete book of Psalms as a separate Psalter, or at least the vast majority of its chapters, written in Ashkenazic hands and without Latin glosses. So we can have some sense that this may be for Jews. Some with Rashi's commentary, that helps too, although it's not, not an absolute indicator. Others without it can be dated to the 13th century. And so here again, this also suggests that the book of Psalms is now on the table, not just in some uh, large communal sense, but perhaps for individuals as well. Uh, there are also, and I can't really talk about this, there are also a few French manuscripts that copy Sifre and Met uh, it's actually backwards, usually, Tehillim Mishle Yov in the margins. Sarah Offenberg is smiling because she knows at least one of those and probably all of them. Uh, I, found I found five so far, all in northern France, except one that may be in Germany, but again, you'll ask me. Uh, this suggests that Tehillim is there, but obviously that might not be for private reading, although the question remains open. So we've got the um, um, handbook evidence, and we've got the practical evidence, the derivations that we've talked about, both in northern France and Germany, happening in the 13th century and happening a lot. Before you see almost nothing, we'll talk about that now, we'll push a little further back, you see the Psalters being produced, and so things seem to be moving in this direction. Let's take it a step further. The key, though, at least from my, to my thinking, and this is one of the hardest moving parts, so watch the handouts, um, is that there is a section in the Ashkenazic liturgy which I think may hold an even stronger key to how Psalms recitation, recitation developed. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, others may not be. This is a section at the end of the prayer service that originated during the middle of the Geonic period and is also reflected in Eretz Israel rites found in the Cairo Geniza, which 
the greatest scholars of Jewish studies in our, and of Ashkenaz too have discussed, Professor, amongst them, not to exclude anybody, but Professor Urbach, Professor Tashma, Aleyhem Shalom. this is the section called the Ma'amadot, or Ma'arachot, the end of the prayer service, which was still being recited in Northern Europe during the 11th, 12th centuries, and even a bit beyond. This section provides important evidence, as I said, for the recitation daily of additional psalms in northern France that I don't think has been noticed in all of the studies. There was so much to do, they had to leave me something to do, and I think we're going to talk about what that might be. And the trajectory of these sections, and how these sections move, how these ma'amadot shift, will also explain, at least uh, uh, partially, the renewed interest in the recitation of psalms in Germany that we talked about. So both northern France and Germany have a psalms component, and it's connected with these ma'arachot, to my slightly askew way of thinking, but I'll show you what I mean. And now, these ma'amadot, ma'arachot, are related to the temple, temple service of old, and especially to the representation of the Jewish people who were not present when the temple service was being performed each day, and it was a prayer unit. They were saying along with the sacrifices, they were sort of hooking in. And this prayer unit was broken into pieces to be recited each day of the week, as had been the case in the days of the temple. Uh, there are a lot of things in here, but just to highlight a couple of them, uh, a lengthy series of verses such as the 70 or 72 verses that begin with the phrase, Vata Hashem Magen Ba'adi, so you have prayers, you have these magical formulations that were recited for practical purposes, even if they're verses. They're being recited in that direction, along with sections of the written and oral law relating to the temple service and culminating with the recitation of the Aleinu prayer. So you've got Torah study, you've got magical or protection uh, uh, formulae, um, and you've got something which relates to the temple service each day because that's what the people who are sort of representing the Jewish people are doing. To cut a lot uh, out, the Ma'arachot were revamped by Eliyahu Hazakain of Laman in the first half of the 11th century. Eliyahu Hazakain's composition, his Ma'arachot, or Ma'amadot, begin with the section of the creation story at the beginning of Genesis for each day of the week, followed by a prophetic selection in the daily psalm, the Shir Shal Yom, along with oral descriptions of the temple service. So he's hooking into all these things in a very packed and organized way, and in a way that people could relate to it. And in some versions, the Torah portion of Hazinu, along with the Ten Commandments, that were added on Mondays and Thursdays. And it concludes with additional passages designed to encourage divine sustenance, so, such as the so-called Parashat Haman and the Parashat Hayirah, to which were later added Shirei Yichud associated with the German pietists. The purpose behind the recitation of Sidrei HaMa'aracha, aside from the requests and tchinot that were also included for protection, sustenance, and forgiveness, so they sort of, he sort of broke it all down, was twofold. One, to evoke the temple service and promote yearning for its restoration by substituting prayers for the sacrificial offerings, and secondly, to provide an opportunity for variegated Torah study. Torah, actually they usually do Ketuvim Nevi'im, but that doesn't matter, that's fine, at the end of the morning service by reciting these various passages. Now, the change is that the longer, these longer Ma'amadot compilations were significantly truncated beginning in the 12th century. They were very long, and even uh, Eliyahu Azakain's, which was better, but the original ones were very, very long, and Tashwa Orbach have written about this, with a few of its components moved to the beginning of the service. There are pieces in today's standard service that are front-loaded that had been sort of in the back. This was done for several reasons. Uh, though among those expressed explicitly so that people could get out of the synagogue a little bit earlier in order to get to their uh, work, sounds a little familiar even today, um, uh, also because there was some concern that the magical formulae within the Mato came to, to be regarded as inappropriate for widespread recitation, but certainly in light of this session, some of this reduction, layman and Rabbinic, rabbinic figures said the same prayers. The rabbis were saying these things, the laymen were expected to. How they can say these things, again, I'll have to quote myself on literacy in Ashkenaz and literary memory, others have written about it too. They were trained to read many, not all. Men were trained to read at some point, mainly based on biblical verses. To use Mary Carruthers' term, they had a very good literary memory, and that was then plugged in to the prayers. But it was an awful lot to do. So some of this, undoubtedly, is to help the lay people manage better. And I actually found a manuscript piece this week in Jerusalem, which thankfully confirms exactly what I was going to say is pure speculation. I've now got a passage that confirms it very nicely. I'll talk about that at the very end. Um, and so these changes will help laymen and scholars uh, at the same time. Um, can't now, let, let me get into now what we find in the liturgies in France and Germany, and I'll show you how to connect the Ma'amadot 
complex to the Tehillim structures and to this new interest in Tehillim. Careful review of Northern French liturgies and manuscript, boy, my Claret Sirah's not here, uh, reveals that the daily recitation, but somebody's gonna tell it, reveals that the daily recitation of a significant unit of psalms, the 15 gradual psalms, or Shirei Mahalot, um, was also associated with the Mahamadot section. This was also in there originally, at least in Northern France. And it's not so surprising. On the basis of his Geniza uh, scholarship, the late professor Ezra Fleischer demonstrated in a book written many, many years ago, he wrote so much that all these things that he wrote at first, you have to sort of go back and look. Uh, but he demonstrated that this unit of Psalms, 120 to 134, was found in the prayer rites of Eretz Yisrael, but as part of the Psuke de Zimra, the early part of the service, the required part for the weekdays and for the Sabbath as well. However, it's clear that the daily recitation of these psalms as part of the Psuche de Zimra was discontinued at some point, owing perhaps, or perhaps mainly, to their prominent inclusion in the Christian liturgy. And let me say four words, you know, 12, but you'll hear four, um, about Christian recitation of psalms, and you'll see the connection. If there are questions, I can go back. The Benedictine rule of the sixth century advised that the entire book of psalms should be recited in the course of a week and that those monks who failed to do so, quote, betray extreme indolence and lack of devotion. However, abbreviations were made over time owing to various exigencies. In the second half of the eighth century, Alcuin of Northumbria sent an abbreviated Psalter, which had been composed initially by Betty to Bishop Arno of Salzburg, that featured short expositions of the 15 gradual Psalms. Um, and in fact, he also sent a letter to Charlemagne saying how the lay people were entitled to a smaller number and more convenient series of psalm verses and prayers, right? So they're trying to make changes for the clergy, for the laity as well. Other abbreviations followed, but the 15 gradual psalms still remained among the key components. Monastic soldiers from Northern Europe during the 11th and 12th centuries instruct that these psalms should be chanted as part of the morning prayers each day during the summer season, and the books of hours produced from the for the laity from the late 12th, 12th century onward also featured these psalms in a prominent place. And so what may have happened here is, as the Christian liturgies included and became more insistent, the Jewish liturgies, perhaps, they didn't back away completely, as you'll see, but they shifted it from the key part of the service to a sort of a later part. And here I should also note, Naftali Vider um, actually has a very interesting thing that was written new for his collected essays. It's not a reprint. About the Karaite practices when it comes to Shirei Halabalot. So they're Something interesting there, I'll just throw in, Bacha ibn Pakuda in his Chovot Halvavot talks about reciting psalms at night. So this is not only Ashkenaz, but as we'll see now, here it goes. It appears from a number of manuscripts that the recitation of the Shirei HaMalot emerged in Jewish liturgies from northern France by or during the 12th century, although not in the Psuche de Zimra section, but at the back of the bus in that Ma'amadot area. The 15 Shirei Ma'alot were, were preceded there by the eight alphabets uh, uh, of verses contained in Psalms 119, right? 176 verses, eight times the number of alphabet, the alphabets with a, uh, each letter being represented, which were also understood to have embedded within them a series of supplications for various kinds of protection and success, also a very strong call to Torah study. Uh, a very good example of this is found in a Sidur Minhag Tzorfat copied in a small personal format. So this was not a, uh, you know, this was a personal Sidur, uh, uh, ostensibly, in the 13th century, and described at some length, nearly 60 years ago, by Colette Sirah in Revue des Etudes Juives, um, that the end, of, and if you look at that text, the end of the daily prayer service records a series of magical pakashot for physical protection and success and spiritual mastery. These are then followed by Psalms 119, 15 Shirei HaMalot, another set of supplications, and Aleinu, all of which, if you're keeping score, by the way, comports quite well with the Trinotu Tehillim that's being represented in the Smak text, in the, in the preface to Smak that we talked about before. Four other northern French liturgies also include the recitation of Psalms 19 and Shirei HaMalot, along with the recitation of various Trinot, mystical Bakashot, and Psalms 83 as well. And uh, as we'll see, and I, I, this I would like to ask Colette, uh, Psalms 83, which I'll come back to in a moment, is found in French liturgies, not all of them. I have not found a single German liturgy that has Psalm 83. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. It is worth noting, uh, 
especially since Judas here, that in, light of, that in two of these manuscripts, material, he knows this very well, material from Sefer, Sefer Mitzvot Katan is actually interleaved with sections associated with Eliyahu Zakein of Laman, Seder Hamaracha. So this is all being brought together. In another manuscript dated to 1291, again a personal sized Machzor Min Hag Tzorfat, which does not contain the daily prayers. It starts with the festival prayers, but it contains the following quote. Elu Hamiz Morim, these psalms, Tov Omram Bechol Yom. And the psalms then, it then lists the 15 Shirei HaMalot. Additionally, several manuscripts of Machsor Vitri, among many other French rites, as I just mentioned, place Psalm 83 just prior to Aleinu as well. The, this psalm begins, Shir Mizmor La'asaf, and I'll just translate the first, the first and the last lines, O Lord, do not remain silent, rise, rise to defeat Israel's enemies, and it concludes, they will recognize that your name stands alone, rising above the entire world, and is then followed by related liturgical and scriptural formulations, urging divine vengeance. The earliest manuscript of Machsor Vitri, and I found one or two others, I'm not sure about the third, but at least two, uh, says the following, Yesh mekomot, at that point, Sh'omrim, Shir Mizmor La'asaf, there are places which include this, although it is not said in German communities, so the whole Arei Ashkenaz, Ain't Omrimoto. They don't say it in Germany. And it then says, gives a further instruction for those in the French orbit, which reflects the northern French affinity, just noted for reciting Shirei Amalot at this point. Aval al tavo. If there are troubles, Omrim Sharm is Morim Shirei Amalot. Get out the rest of the liturgy. So this is a very French thing, and they're saying the Germans don't do this. The northern French practice of reciting Shirei Amalot sections at this point of the liturgy, whether or not there were specific troubles on the horizon, was, giving, was given an additional framework with the appearance in the mid-13th century of the Shir HaYichud composition called Ya, but it's Ya is because that's the rhyme in each case, that's the, the single rhyme, Min HaKeren, HaKadosh Rabbi Netanel, even the name is a poem, uh, a Tosafist colleague of the Tosafist Yechiel Ben Joseph of Paris and the brothers of Evro. This single line, Shir HaYichud, which also includes Trinot and calls for repentance, is also divided into days of the week and became interspersed with Eliyahu Zahazakein Seder HaMaracha. At least one manuscript, again perhaps another, seeking to streamline, streamline the daily liturgical demands, assigns two Shirei HaMalot passages, so instead of saying 15 each day, say two each day, and call me, the, no, say two each day, three on Shabbat, that's how you get your 15. So you get it in that way again, streamlining, but you cover the group. Given that Netanel's composition also includes a fixed section of Trinot on the Sabbath as well, it is highly likely that this, is, so if all the week is on Sabbath, it is highly likely that this liturgical composition is yet another plank in the liturgical context on which Isaac of Corbet, who had also studied the Tosafist Beit Midrash at Evro, urged his readers, at least as his students indicate, to include the readings from his Sefer Mitzvot Katan, and they are to be considered as akin to the recitation of Tehilim u Trinot. And there's something in the contemporary Orchot Chaim, which I won't go through now. This is a test in other sources as well. Let me say a few words of Germany, about Germany, because the time is going in any case. Yeah, if we look at, I knew that might if we look at German Sidurim now, sure enough, I can't find Psalms 83 there at all. Uh, they do say, and yet they do say, Eliyahu Seder HaMaracha, and they also don't say Shirei HaMalot on a weekday. Some in Chal Shabbat, but that actually takes longer, the afternoon service on the Sabbath, but that takes longer to develop. So this morning piece is not there. However, but wait, there's more. What you do find in Germany, because after all, you had all these 13th century figures, uh, Rokeach, Victor Katz, Ephraim Ben Shimshon, a whole list. What you do find in German manuscripts, Sidur manuscripts, but not in French ones, are an entire, uh, an entire Tehillim, placed either before the prayer service or right after. The, oh, the, I have six manuscripts like that. The only, prop, the only question is whether it goes before or it goes after. And I can't show you now, but of the Germans who talked about it, some wanted it earlier, they have reasons for it, some wanted it later, both in terms of derivations. So, let me just try to sum it all up. First of all, as far as Menachem ibn Zarach is concerned, Perhaps his father did get it from his French background, although in order to prove that to you, I really have to talk about Spain. That's another talk, not for today. So let me give you the conclusion right now. Further research is needed to verify, first and foremost, that all extant manuscript versions and remnants of German and Northern French liturgies have been correlated, and that's a lot of fun. Nonetheless, the preliminary results suggested here, presented here suggest that the differences identified between Northern France and Germany are perhaps related 
significantly to the status of the ma'alot section. The tr uh, I'm sorry, ma'amadot section. The truncating of the ma'amadot that began in the 12th century provided an opportunity. German rabbinic scholars and pietists of the 13th century who looked at this very much for Torah study, although they throw in some other goodies as well, uh, they decided that it was a propitious time to push for the laity. In other words, this is mainly to help the laity. It gets out the complicated bakashot. It gets out the potentially dangerous request. It gets out that whole section. It also gives them psukim, verses. Their literary memory, that's in their wheelhouse. That's what they know best. And if you say to him a lot, eventually, no matter how literate you are or aren't, you can memorize it, but if, you're, if you have a literary memory, it will start to go in. And by the way, just because the whole Tehillim is there, and that's what's recommended, doesn't mean that the whole Tehillim was said. But so in Germany, they push the entire Sefer Tehillim before or after prayer service, and the derivations are very interesting, in order to uh, replace the Ma'amadot pieces or to supplant them with that, and as we've seen, Tehillim gives you protection, Tehillim helps for troubles, Tehillim is Torah study, uh, even temple service if you want to stretch it a little bit, but it certainly gets most of those goals. On the French side, they already had Tehillim in there, the Shirei Habalot. So what they did on the French side, as Machsor Vitri indeed, we have that, they don't, was to centralize that, make it more of a requirement. Again, Tehillim Pegimel certainly, Kuf Yud Tet, 83, 119, and the Shirei HaMalot. And again, it's very clear that the passage in Sefer Mitzvot Katan is not blowing smoke. There's an awful lot behind this in terms of actual uh, practices. However, because of Judah's, uh, because of, uh, not Judah, but not that Judah, because of Isaac's affinity with the German pietists, we also have to imagine, and his, uh, uh, time at Evro, that he may have been aware of the German push for Sefer Tehillim Kulo, for the entire Sefer Tehillim to be recited at some point, either before or after. So to conclude for today, uh, the Ashkenazim in the 13th century had an awful lot to do, I think, in these very specific ways with the recitation of Seder Tehillim in connection with the prayer service. Thank you very much. worth it, but I am afraid we don't really have time for questions. Before you all drift away, we all drift away.